And from there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, Sifronician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she, she went home and found the child lying in bed and the, and the demon gone. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that in your infinite wisdom and provision, you have revealed yourself to us through it. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that it is to read it this morning and to consider it together. Father, I ask humbly that you would open our eyes. Lord, I ask that you'd open our hearts. Lord, help us to see this woman and her great faith. And our need for ours, for us to have great faith as well. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it to Mark chapter 7. And then to also put your finger in Matthew chapter 15. Uh, the Gospels, all four of them, recount different scenes from Jesus' life and ministry. And each Gospel writer sometimes presents the story in a slightly different way reflecting the whole truth of it uh, for their audience. And so Mark has it in his particular way, and Matthew has it in his. And we're going to go back and forth between the two a little bit today. But jumping right in, Mark chapter 7, verse 24, Mark writes, And from there, that's the region of Galilee, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The region of Tyre and Sidon. There are two things that we need to know today about this particular region. And the first is this. This region was known as a Gentile region. So Jesus being Jewish and all of his disciples being Jewish, uh, he was from the region of Galilee. But they're traveling to the region of Tyre and Sidon. It's about 35 miles northwest of Galilee, right on the, the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. In a region that was known as Syrophoenicia, today it's modern-day Lebanon. So if you could picture, right on the coast of the Mediterranean, this particular region, north of the, of the region of Galilee. And it was a Gentile region. The, region we need, the reason we need to know this is that there were a lot of differences between Jews and Gentiles. You had a lot of cultural differences and a lot of religious differences. So Jews were those who worshipped Yahweh. The one true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, and the one who had given them all of their religious practices. But Gentiles at this time were mostly known as pagans, those who worshipped many, many different gods, and usually in the form of idols made out of wood or stone. And so they had completely different religious backgrounds. They also were known to not get along. This stemmed from historical conflict between Jews and Gentiles, and it also stemmed from their present differences culturally. So oftentimes there was a great deal of tension or animosity between Jews and Gentiles. So that's the first thing we need to know, is that when Jesus goes north to this region of Tyre and Sidon, he's going away from Jewish territory and into Gentile territory. The second thing we need to know is that despite being a Gentile territory, the, the city of Tyre, right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, was the largest prominent city closest to Galilee. And that means that there was a lot of trade passing between the two regions. And with trade comes traders. And with trade parties come people. And so the second thing we need to know for today is that 
people would have heard of Jesus in this particular region of Tyre. So even though they were Gentiles, because of the trade between the two regions, Jesus was not completely unknown. And indeed, in the next two lines in Mark's account, it shows us that this is the case. Verse 24, continuing, it says that he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. So he goes into the town and he wants some alone time with his disciples. Maybe it was a long journey. Maybe he intended to teach them something in private. We're not exactly sure, but he wanted to be alone with them, but he couldn't be hidden, Mark tells us. And then in verse 25, it shows us that clearly at least someone in this town had heard specifically who he was because look who comes. Verse 25, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Jesus was known in this particular region. And so when he comes, he cannot be hidden. But the woman woman comes to him, meaning she has at least some idea of who he is and what he's capable of doing. And we can see that because she falls down before him. You don't typically just fall down before other people, do you? This is a gesture of, of humility of deference, of of recognition of the person's authority before whom she falls down. Falling down like this is a desperate cry for help. You don't do that without some knowledge that the person in front of you has the ability to help you. And so she must have heard something about Jesus to make her think, if I go to him with my problem, with The fact that my daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit, which is another term for a demon. If I bring my need to him, maybe he can help. And so she goes to him, and she falls down at his feet at the end of verse 25. And now, if we hadn't already heard this passage read aloud earlier, as Deborah did for us, then I imagine that many of us, when we hear this, that that a woman with great need comes to Jesus and falls down before him and begs him to help her, I imagine that most of us would think that Jesus would immediately, compassionately, generously respond to her request for help and powerfully help her in his typically awe-inspiring fashion. That is what we might expect Jesus to do. But remember where we are right now. We are in Gentile, Tyre, and Sidon, a region where there is tension between Jews and Gentiles. And in verse 26, in case we had any doubt, Mark makes it very clear. Verse 26, now the woman was a Gentile. Couldn't get more clear than that. A Syrophoenician by birth, meaning she's from this region where they're in at the moment. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. This woman is desperate. She's a Gentile, and Jesus is Jew. And we know that that there's tension here. There's animosity here. The Jews and the Gentiles don't get along. But nevertheless, here she is. She's come to Jesus. She's fallen down at his feet. Verse 26 says she begged him to cast the demon out of the daughter. And now, what is he going to do? Verse 27. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, I'm willing to bet today that if we hadn't already heard this story, none of us would have predicted Jesus to have responded like that. And yet he does. So the task for us is to figure out why. And indeed, my friends, this is why Mark has written this account of this gospel for us. It's to show us who Jesus is and why he has come and what our response to him should be. And so when we look at this text and we're confronted with something that seems odd, it's like we have to ask this question, why? And the way that people discern the teaching in the text is through careful study. 
And so that's what we're going to do together this morning. We're going to go step by step through this to see what Mark wants us to see. And first, we're going to address the elephant in the room. Did Jesus just call her a dog? You'll recall that we've mentioned the tension between Jews and Gentiles a few times. It's not uncommon in Jesus' day for Jews to insult Gentiles by calling them dogs. Ancient Jewish texts show this to be true. Uh, and this probably stems from the fact that dogs in, those day, in that day were mostly not domesticated. They were wild. They would run through the streets of the cities. They would look for anything they could eat. And because of that, they ate anything including food which Jews considered to be unclean. So the dogs were unclean. And now when you look at the religious practices of the Gentiles, they are not observing the, the law of the nation of Israel. They're not following the cleanliness laws that Jews were following. So they were considered to be unclean. And so you have an unclean animal and an unclean person. And, well, before long, Jews were calling Gentiles dogs. But is that what Jesus has just done here? And the key to this passage is looking closely at the text. Because in the Greek language, there are different terms for dogs. And the term that Jesus has just used is not a term for a wild dog running through the streets looking for anything to devour, the insulting term for a dog. No, this is the term that means a small dog or a pet dog. And so he's using this term not as an insult, but as a way to make his analogy. Let's look at the analogy again. He says here, in verse 27, he says, let the, little, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You can see the analogy that he's just presented to them. It's the picture of the family meal. You've got children of the family who are at the table waiting to be fed. And everybody knows that for a father, this is one of his primary responsibilities, one of his most basic and essential tasks as a father is to provide food for his children. And so if he's there with his own children and they need to be fed, it would be totally wrong for him to take the food that was intended for the kids and shove it under the table for the dogs. Everybody knows that would have been wrong. Just picture yourself, okay? Picture your parents had just made for you your favorite meal. Ribeye steak. Medium rare. Baked sweet potato. Buttery green beans. Homemade bread. Just as you were about to slice into that meat, they said, oh, sorry, and put it under the table for the dogs. Everybody knows that would not have been okay to do. It would have been the father uh, uh, neglecting his responsibility to his own children to take food from his own children and to give it to the pets. Everyone would agree about that. And that is Jesus' analogy. And if it's still a little bit foggy at this point, Matthew is going to give us some help. Okay, I said put your finger in Matthew 15. If you're there, flip back to Matthew chapter 15 because he inserts a detail that's going to help us see this analogy in totality. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, it says that Jesus answered this woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then it's only after explaining the scope of his mission that he was sent to Israel that he gives the analogy of the children and the pet dogs. So the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jewish people, are the children in the analogy, and the pet dogs represent the Gentiles. And he, this is what he's saying. My mission, what I came here for, was for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the children of the people of God. Why? Because I'm their promised Messiah. Because I am descended from their forefathers. Because I was prophesied by their prophets. Because I am told by their scriptures. Because I am taught in the synagogue by their teachers. And the fulfillment of their hopes and of their prayers. I have come for them. That's why I've come. And so it wouldn't be right for me to take the food intended for them, so to speak, and give it 
to feed you. And now, even as we're dealing with one elephant in the room, that Jesus hasn't truly insulted her, but yet we've just encountered another elephant in the room. And that is that even if he wasn't insulting her, he's still saying no to her. And why would he do that? This is a desperate woman, and apparently he is denying her request. But again, Jesus is not responding in the way we might expect him to respond. So how do we deal with this? We'll flip back to Mark's account in chapter 7, and we're going to see how. Okay, just as the term Mark uses for pet dogs helps us to see what Jesus is saying in this analogy, so he's inserted another term that helps us to see Jesus' true intentions. Looking once more at verse 27 of Mark chapter 7, he says, And he said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Let the children be fed first. Now we're reading this in English. It's translated and it's a wonderful translation. But when you look at the original language, which is in Greek, the word first is, is fronted. It's placed at the beginning of the sentence for emphasis. If you were to translate this quite literally, it would actually be, let first to be fed the children. Let first to be fed the children. Now that sounds really awkward in English, so the translators have smoothed it out for us and said, let the children be fed first. But the point here is this, that there is a first action, which implies that there's going to be a second action. There is a first action, which implies a second action. And let me give you an example of this. I want you to imagine you're talking with a friend. And the friend asks you, uh, what did you do yesterday? And you said, oh, well, first I went to the gym. And they said, okay, what else did you do? And you said, oh, no, that's it. I just went to the gym. Well, then why did you say first? First implies that there's something else to come later. And Jesus says, let the children be fed first, which implies that there's a second feeding coming here. And it's not only in this passage. Okay, we're zooming in right now on this one particular passage. But when you zoom out for a minute, what you're going to see is that this is reflective of Jesus' ministry as a whole. Jesus has come first for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. That we see this, that he's come. He's the promised Messiah. He's come to proclaim the kingdom of God to the people of God. That's his first mission. But as Mark is beginning to show us in this passage and others like it, Jesus' mission will expand beyond the ethnic people of Israel, the nation of Israel, to the Gentiles, and indeed to the very ends of the earth. We're beginning to get a glimpse of that, a hint of that, in Mark's gospel, even as this word first hints at but the fact that there's another feeding coming for this woman, okay? And I want to just point this out here because uh, it's not unique to the Gospel of Mark. Paul, when he writes his letter to the Romans in chapter 1, he describes the Gospel in Romans 1.16 where he says that he is not ashamed of the Gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. It's first Second, there's a first action and a second action. What he's saying is that in Christ, good news of salvation has come. And it came first to the Jews because he's their Messiah, promised by their scriptures, but came second to the Gentiles. He's not only the Savior of Israel, but of the entire world. There's a first and then a second, a progression in Jesus' ministry, and then later on through the ministry of the disciples. It's the pattern that he's carried out his mission. And so here, coming back to Mark, hear this please. This isn't just how he carried out his mission. This is how he planned his mission. This was the plan from the beginning. Sometimes Jesus' ministry is portrayed as if he comes only to the Jews and then he's rejected, so he decides in a kind of pragmatic fashion to go to the Gentiles almost as a consolation, like, well, if you guys won't have me, I'll go to the Gentiles. But no, that was never the plan. As any student of the Old Testament could tell you, you're going to see that from the beginning, God has had a plan for the redemption of all peoples, 
Jews and Gentiles. From Genesis, God's promise to Abraham that through his offspring, all the families of the world would be blessed. To Israel's own history, as many of Israel's prominent people were not from the ethnic people of Israel. They were brought in, including many of Jesus' own ancestors who would have been considered foreigners back in their own day. To prophecy, like Isaiah, there's probably none more prominent than him, Isaiah says in no uncertain terms that the servant of the Lord, which is a messianic uh, title, the servant of the Lord would be a light for the Gentiles, and that salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. In Isaiah 49, 6, it doesn't get any more clear than that. God's plan, his intention was always to extend his grace to the Gentiles. He would come to the Jew first, but then to the Gentile. A first action followed by the second, and it was very intentional. And that is what brings us back to this woman on her knees begging Jesus for help. Jesus knows what he's going to do for her. He has always intended what he's about to do for her. The subtle inclusion of the word first hints at what he's about to do for her, even as his ministry to the Gentiles hints that the gospel will extend to all peoples. And so what is he doing here? Why is he apparently denying her request? This is a test of faith. This is a test of faith. Think about it. How is she going to respond? How could she respond? She could become discouraged, walk away. Would she be insulted? Would she fire back? Would she try to defend herself or make a case for herself for why she deserves his help? Would she tell him how much she's done to try to help her daughter? Whatever avenues she's pursued, attempts she's made to try to make her well again, would she be undone by his words and just completely break apart and pour out the experience of her suffering, of her disappointment, pain? What will she do? Look at verse 28. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. She actually agrees with him. She takes his analogy of the children and the pet dogs and says, yes, Lord. She agrees with him and says, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And no one expected that response, let me tell you. Of everything she could have said, that is one that nobody saw coming. And then look how Jesus responds to her in verse 29. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. For this statement, Jesus says, she got her request. Her daughter was delivered. The demon was driven out. And she was made well. And the mother was finally, finally given peace. Why? For this statement, Jesus says. And we're going to go back to Matthew one more time because once again in his account, he adds something that gives clarity here about this interaction with Jesus. In Matthew 15, 28, it says, Then Jesus answered her, O woman, Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. O oh woman, he said, great is your faith. Great is your faith. According to Jesus, this woman's response, her statement back to him, indicated that she had great faith. And the question that we should ask is, what was so great about it? Was it that she believed Jesus was important? A lot of people believed that. Was it that she believed he could cast out demons? A lot of people believed that too. 
What was it about what, what she believed that was so great about, that he said, your faith is great? Back to Mark. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Following his own analogy, she says, Jesus, Lord, please don't get me wrong. I don't begin to think for a minute that there's anything about me that deserves a seat at your table. Instead, I come because I need help. And I believe you can give it. For this statement, Jesus says, your daughter is made well. For this statement in Matthew's account, great is your faith. What is so great about her faith, my friends? Her great faith is that it is humble. Great faith is humble faith. And this is what Jesus and Mark, writing it for us, and the Holy Spirit inspiring it for us, are teaching us here today. It's that great faith is humble faith. The nature of great faith is found in humility. Think about this woman with me. She came with nothing. No defense, no justification, no argument for why she deserved Jesus' mercy or why he should give it to her. None of it. Instead, she came humbly saying, Jesus, I'm helpless. Please help me. And that's it. And that, Jesus says, qualifies as great faith. The kind of faith that Jesus describes as great isn't faith in yourself. It's faith in God in spite of yourself. If there is a truth that our culture needs to hear right now, it might be that one. That faith is not in yourself. It's in God in spite of yourself. Friends, if only we could grasp this today. Our culture is so obsessed with trying to justify ourselves, to present ourselves as worthy of praise and favor. We offer up our accomplishments. We present our bona fides, our performance reports. We relish in our own track records. And in stark contrast to all of that, Jesus presents this woman who willingly acknowledges that she deserves None of it, but comes humbly. No justification, only her need, believing that Jesus can help her. This is great faith. John Calvin. John Calvin makes the list of one of the greatest theologians of the past 500 years. And he was a man whose own bona fides are second to none. In fact, he wrote one of the greatest volumes of Christian theology in the history of the world at age 26, if you could believe that. John Calvin had this to say about faith. Quote, faith is like an empty, open hand stretched out toward God with nothing to offer and everything to receive. That's what faith is. Nothing to offer and everything to receive. And that's what this woman has nothing to offer. I recognize Jesus. I am not at the seat, at a seat at your table, but I come humbly because I believe you can help me. That's humble faith. That is great faith. Pastor Tim Keller puts it like this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. He says, quote, if you want God's grace, all you need is need. All you need is nothing. But that kind of spiritual humility is hard to muster. We come to God saying, look at all I've done, or maybe look at all I've suffered. God, however, wants us to look to him. This is the faith of this woman. And the bigger, broader teaching exposed by this passage in Mark is that this is not just one example of one person's faith in, at one point in time for, for you know, that one instance. No, this is actually a picture of how anybody 
who has faith in Jesus comes to Jesus. Because when we think for a second that anything about us merits or deserves a place at Christ's table, then we have totally misunderstood the gospel. The gospel is not, God, I've tried really hard to follow you. I've tried hard to obey you. I've done a lot of good things. I, I, I've served you and I've avoided all of these bad things. So please, will you accept me now? That is not the gospel. The gospel is, that is works-based religion. It has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it does nothing to solve the deeper issue at hand, which is that we are sinful, broken people who cannot fix ourselves. Nothing we do can overcome the weight of our sin that we carry by nature and by choice. We cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior, and that is why Christ has come. We could never earn a seat at His table but by laying down his own life to pay for the sins that we have committed, he comes to us and says, the meal is ready. I've prepared it for you. Come, take a seat. But Jesus, I'm not good enough. I know, but I am. But Jesus, I, I don't deserve it. That's true. And you never will. But Jesus, I can't accept this. My child, what you need to see is that God, through me, has accepted you. It's precisely when you realize that you don't deserve God's gift of grace that you begin to receive it. Recently, I heard an incredible story of Sidney McLaughlin. Sidney McLaughlin is an Olympic track and field athlete. And in 2021, she uh, set the world record in qualifying for the 400 meter hurdles. Then she went to the Olympics and won the gold medal, breaking her own world record. And as I was learning this story, I came across this incredible quote that she put on uh, Twitter. It was after she, she qualified for the Olympics, setting a world record, and here's what she said. Quote, I no longer run for self-recognition, but to reflect his perfect will that is already set in stone. I don't deserve anything, but by grace through faith, Jesus has given me everything. Records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. Thank you, Father. Isn't that beautiful? That is great faith. That is humble faith. That is faith which says, whatever I've got on my resume doesn't matter. Christ alone. He is who saves you. Nothing you've done. So, my friends, Grace Church... Where are you with this today? Are you still trying to show God that you deserve his favor? That you've done the right things? Jesus, I, I, I've been with the church on Sunday mornings. Jesus, I, I've given money. I've done community service. I, I, I've gone on mission trips. Jesus, I've done all these good things. Or, or maybe you're saying that I've avoided the wrong things. Jesus, I, I haven't defrauded anybody. Jesus, I haven't stolen money from my, my company. Jesus, I haven't cheated on my spouse. Jesus, I haven't... Are you still doing that? Saying, look at my resume, God. Don't you accept me now? Are you trying to justify yourself? Or have you come like this woman, humbly, nothing to offer, nothing to prove, yourself, nothing to justify where you are, and simply said, help me, Lord. There is an old, old hymn. I think you all are beginning to know that I like old hymns. Uh, it's called Rock of Ages. We're going to sing it in a moment before we take communion together. 
But there's one line in this quote, or in this hymn, that says it perfectly. It says this. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Look to Jesus on his cross and nothing else and receive the gift of grace, of salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word, for your word which amazes us, confronts us, teaches us, transforms us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your people and to hear it. And Lord, I pray that you would enable it to penetrate our hearts and change us, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would, if there are any hearts, Lord, that are hard, would you soften them, Father? Would you enable us to be just like this woman, humbly coming to you in faith? We pray in Jesus' name.